to all of you again. What a time we've had. Indeed. Here at the Danish Baking Show, we want to show you one last very special baking recipe. To celebrate the new Umbrago 9 update, we are going to bake an Umbrago 9 cake. The color of the cake will of course be our Umbrago signature blue. To do that, we need this blue dye. To get the blue dye, you must jump on your bike and head to the local supermarket to find it. You'll hand over money to the cashier in order to take it home with you, then jump on your bike right back home and mix it with some glaze. And now you have the most important ingredients to make this masterpiece of a cake. Other ingredients are flour, chocolate, strawberry, blueberry, grapes and lots of sugar, which you can all find in the local supermarket. But Piake, that's not our signature on Braco Blue. Oh, let's say, uh, you know what happens when you coat or bake? Not everything goes according to plan. But as long as the end result is amazing, we're all happy. I think I'll have a bite. Gorgeous. That's it, folks. Enjoy the rest of Cold Garden and, of course, your Umbraco 9 cake. Hello everyone and welcome to the show. My name is Emma and I'm a developer advocado here at Umbreco HQ, also known as Developer Advocate. And today I'm also going to be your host for the show. And hello everyone, my name is Rune. I am product communications producer at Umbraco and I'll also be your host today. And that was just a little throwback to our most recent Code Garden where we unveiled the Umbraco V9 cake. And we are super excited to say that we are now in the presence of the final version of the Umbraco 9 cake. Ta-da! An even better shade of blue, and it's going to taste amazing, isn't it? I'm sure it is. Yep. And look at the color. Look at the color. So beautiful. Um, but it's not just the cake we're here to, uh, to look at. It isn't? Nope. Okay. In a few minutes, we'll actually be launching the next major version uh, of uh, Umbraco. Umbraco 9 is here, running on uh, .NET 5, ASP.NET Core, all the cool new tech. Yeah, it's super exciting. We've done our very best to bring together as many friendly faces as we can, some with the bribe of cake, others remotely. Um, and just to really say how their experience has been, to get us all excited about what we got to look forward to and what you have to look forward to when you pick up Umbraco 9. Exactly. Before we dive into all the techy bits uh, and really uh, do a deep dive on Umbraco 9, uh, we'd like to kind of um, just take a moment and reflect on why we are actually, uh, uh, why we actually embarked on this journey uh, and why we're doing Umbraco 9. Uh, and for this, we've invited a panel. Um, We've uh, got Bjarke Berg, team lead uh, on the core team, uh, Adam Bracco, um, and team, uh, team lead on the Unicore project uh, as well. Uh, we've got uh, Philip Beck Larsen, who is the CMS program manager, uh, Adam Bracco. And last but not smallest, I guess, <laughs> is uh, Kim, uh, CEO and chief friend maker at Umbraco. Congratulations to all of you. Uh, it's a big day, uh, and welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. So a huge welcome and congrats from me too. But let's start with you, Philip. Uh, if you could tell us a little bit about why we started Project Unicore and why Umbraco 9 is such an important step for us. Yeah. Yep. Umbraco 9, as you said, is the, the newest Umbraco version with all the frameworks being switched out to, uh, to .NET Core. And uh, I think when Microsoft announced the, the move from calling it .NET Core to calling it .NET 5, I think they more or less made this a mandatory thing for all projects on, uh, on the .NET stack to, uh, to go to .NET 5. Uh, and uh, of course, we, we think this is really cool. It enables us to do a lot of, uh, of new things uh, that uh, Bjarke and the team will talk a lot about uh, later. But I think it's, it's a pretty big achievement that, uh, that we're here now. Uh, I'm super excited about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think also there's that the fact that we're now on, uh, on .NET Core, .NET 5, I think it really opens up uh, like a new market for us. Uh, 
if you're an agency uh, that uh, wants to win the big enterprise uh, contract, the fact that you can now run Braco in a container on a Linux environment or something like that is, is super important. It'll make you win those big contracts. And if you're just looking to hire your new developers, uh, people straight out of school, uh, at least in Denmark, they teach .NET Core in school. They don't no longer teach .NET Framework, uh, and so like we're we're kind of expanding expanding who we're relevant for. And I think that's the that's the 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 mission that we're always on as a as a framework or as a project is to to continue to be relevant relevant to the market, relevant to developers, and and we're seeing a lot of uh, excitement uh, from developers. Cool. Um, so it's been. Well, I guess it's been more than two years we've been working actively uh, on this project. Um, and uh, a lot of hard work, I think it's safe to say, has gone into all of this. Um, countless hours have, have been spent both from uh, HQ, but certainly also <coughs> from the uh, community. Um, so you could say it's a significant investment, right? Both from, from, from us at HQ, but definitely also a lot of people around the world. Um, might be a bit early to answer this question, but uh, Kim, has it been worth it? <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, the short answer is yes. As you're saying, it's early days. Uh, let's get it launched. Let's get it off the ground. And let the uh, users, practitioners, customers, and so on and so forth be the judge of whether it has been worthwhile, um, this move to .NET Core. But what I know is that this is a solid foundation for future-proofing any Umbrago projects that you are running out there. We are fully, and I repeat, fully on uh, .NET Core, and that proves us, that puts us in front uh, of, uh, of uh, many things and um, gives us an edge uh, in, um, in the future. So that's, um, that's definitely uh, uh, good. I also want to stress that when we embarked on this, it was not only about getting um, uh, Umbrago on .NET Core, but it was also getting an outside-in perspective, getting community involvement, and I'm super uh, humbled that we have had more than 1,300, 1,300 uh, uh, contributions, being PRs, being issues, being learner tons, uh, being whatever you can think of, uh, we have had more than 120 uh, contributors, unique contributors uh, adding to this. So it's a testament to, uh, to the open source, uh, the power of, uh, of open source. And I'm just astonished and super humbled and grateful for, um, for, um, for all that has been involved in, uh, for everyone who has been involved in this, uh, in this process. Well, it's very exciting because in a few minutes we're going to launch Umbraco 9, which is the ultimate version of Umbraco, right? So we're done. <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> are, are we finished? Um, Bjarke, what happens now? Yeah, so first of all, we're not done. <laughs> so what? Te Technology-wise, we are in a good spot now also. Yeah. So we are on the current stack from Microsoft, mm -hmm. which is a perfect starting point for our new journeys and new features. And so... We will release a 9.1 six weeks after the 8.17. We'll just follow the uh, release cadence. Mm. So there's plenty. No to rest for the wicked. No. <laughs> no. And I think it's pretty. I think it's it's worth mentioning also that with this transition, uh, we're going into uh, a strategy of uh, releasing majors more frequently. Mm. So as we announced at, uh, at Code Garden, I think, or maybe even before that, uh, that we plan on shipping new major versions of Umbraco uh, twice a year, which means that you can expect uh, Umbraco 10 to uh, be uh, some, sometime in the spring or early summer of next year, and 11 will also be next year. Uh, and I mean, the, the whole point is that instead of doing these uh, big bang releases, even though they're fun and we get to make cake, uh, <laughs> like we, we, want, we want it to be uh, more predictable for you as an agency, for you as a user to know exactly when is the next version coming, how hard is it going to be to upgrade, uh, what's it going to take? And uh, to answer those questions, uh, I, I think the, the main point is that it's going to be it's going to be easy to upgrade. Uh, the, the upgrade is going to be uh, a one-click thing in uh, in cloud, uh, and and it, sh it should be a, a very limited amount of work so that everybody can be on the newest version, can be evergreen, uh, and always uh, continue to get new features as we go on. So that's good news for agencies, but. 
bad news for us because that's less cake. <laughs> can we can we do cookies for major releases? I, I think cookies for major releases. I think we can too. still do cakes. <laughs> <laughs> that might work. Right. Um, wrapping uh, up this part of it, uh, I have uh, one final question. Um, I think we'll we'll try to go through each of you with this one. Um, what are you most excited about? Uh, kind of. Uh, uh, as we are releasing uh, Umbraco 9. Um, Kim, would you like to start off? Um, to me, two key words are um, uh, that we are reliable. We have done this multi-year um, uh, project, and we have delivered on time. And as we have said, uh, we wanted to deliver. So it, it goes to show that we are uh, reliable. And I'm certain that that's important for, uh, for, for uh, users agencies uh, in, in the Umbraco uh, ecosystem. And then there's this predictability that uh, Philip is talking about, that you can see the road ahead. There's no uh, big surprises, uh, bad surprises. I promise there will be cakes. <laughs> but, uh, but, but we are, uh, we are reliable and predictable, and that's just super important. And did I mention that we are full on .NET Core? <laughs> uh, but that's also... And Info. .NET 5. And .NET 5, <laughs> yes. It's wonderful. Yeah, awesome. Bjarke, what's your yes, takeaway? Um, my point is mainly from a developer perspective. I'm really happy about now I'm able to use the latest features from Microsoft in the C-sharp language. And even when I program in Umbraco, but also when I build a project on top of Umbraco, I can use the latest features. Yeah, I think, I think that's a huge point. And as to what Philip said before, I think also the part of... Uh, being able to follow along with all the new features that uh, Microsoft is going to release. That's just exactly. a, a major part of it, right? Philip, do you want to... Uh, yeah, I think pitch in? I'm, I'm really excited about the, like, like the team effort that has gone into this. Uh, Bjarke and his team and all of HQ and all of the community. Like, it, like we've really worked together on this with, with the RFC processes and every, everything's been transparent and out there. And I, I really appreciate how, how we've gone here. Not only that we're here, but also how we've gone here. I think that's, that's really cool. Then I also think that I know I, I, could, I should only pick one, but I, I think the, the whole point <laughs> that we're, we're cr cross-platform, uh, that enables so much more uh, use cases. Uh, and uh, I mean, the, we're faster. Uh, look at all the CPU cycles that we're saving, all the carbon that's not being emitted because uh, <laughs> of, uh, of, of Umbraco 9. Yeah. I think that's, uh, that's, uh, that's super cool. That's oh. definitely more than one. I think we're going to have to be a bit stricter on these guests. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're yeah. Run also, now that we're having more major releases, right? <laughs> yeah. I know. I think they're overexcited. But this is a good thing, because it is an exciting time. So, speaking of exciting times, I'm feeling a little bit emotional. <laughs> OK, well, gentlemen, it's almost time to release. Are you ready to press the button and put your I think we are. Umbraco 9 out into No, Bunny. <laughs> not, not you. No, no. <laughs> I, think, I think we'll do a little countdown. A right? countdown. So, so we'll go three, two, one, go. Oh, we'll let you do it, Bjarke. Uh. <laughs> no, you, well, why don't you just put your arm around him so he's not doing it alone? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Ready? Three, two, two one, one, go. go. Hard not to dance when you're with Bunny. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> yes. Well done, people. So, congratulations, gentlemen, and congratulations to everyone out there. Yep. Um, Umbraco 9 is now released. You can find the release blog post on .com. <laughs> you can uh, create uh, Umbraco 9 projects on Umbraco Cloud. You can download it from NuGet. Yep. All the things. Go play, go play, go play. Um, so I think um, with the launch out of the way, you're welcome to move out. <laughs> um, we are going to hand it over to uh, Bjarke. You'll kind of be uh, take over as host for the next little while, mm -hmm. um, talking about what Braco 9 actually is from a te technological uh, perspective. So take it away, Bjarke. Yes, but luckily I have a lot of people helping me. So let's just... Uh, Invite Nikolai as the first one. Are you ready? As ready as I can be. <laughs> <laughs> then I will give you this one. Thank you. So let's figure this out. Yeah. So my name is Nikolai, as you heard. 
Uh, I'm here to talk about the change to .NET 5, formerly known as .NET Core. So the first big feature is cross-platform. So Mac and Linux users, you can finally rejoice because now you can develop on Braco from Windows, Mac, or Linux. So with .NET 5, here comes the support with the latest version of C Sharp. So as a student, I can tell you this is a big thing because this is what we learn in school, as Philip told you earlier. So now it should be easier than ever to, found, to find newly graduated developers who already know .NET Core. So let's talk about the new features like records and init-only setters. And I have made an example on the bottom right of your screen where you can use the new init keyword. Um, I've made an example of how to use it on the bottom left where you initialize a new person here. And I set the values, and you can only set the values when you initialize the, the object, and you can never change the values again. And then, last but not least, pattern matching enhancements. So on the top right here, I've made an example where we use equal, not equals null in the .NET framework, and in .NET 5, we use is not null. This is not only more human readable, but also a bit faster, because the, equals, the not equals to operator can actually be overwritten so we have to check before if it's all written or not. And in a new .NET 5 pattern, this is not the case, so it's a bit faster. And let's talk about some globalization. In .NET Framework, we use natural language support, or NLS, and Unix used ICU, or international components for Unicode. In .NET 5, ICU is the standard for everyone. And this comes with some growing pains. So as you can see on the example on the right, ICU accounts for the threat's current culture. And we first set our current culture to Swedish. We then make an integer with the value of minus one. We pass it to a string. Then we change our current culture again to the US and try to pass the string to an integer. And in .NET 5, this will fail because we account for the culture and the Swedish minus is actually a bit bigger than the US minus for some reason. So this will fail. But if you try this in .NET Core 3.1, or you try it in .NET Framework, this will pass just fine. I will now pass it on again. Thank you, Berge. Yep, and for this section, I actually have help from Elitza. <laughs> so. <sighs> Hopefully. Hi, everyone. Elitza from the core team is here, and I'll be talking about the new installation process that you would need to go through when trying to set up on Braco 9. Now you'll be able to install Umbraco with the so-called .NET new templates, so let me start by telling you what are those. This new concept was introduced as part of .NET Core and those templates serve as a useful tool to start new cross-platform projects using the new template engine. It is open source and is doing absolute magic. This is due to the fact that when we start building a new project, we use the .NET new command. This command calls the .NET Core template engine to create the artifacts on disk based on the specified template and options. Besides, the .NET SDK is already equipped with a variety of templates for the developer to get easily started, from console applications to ASP.NET Core apps. We have currently added two custom templates, one for creating an empty Umbraco project, it resembles installing the Umbraco NuGet package on an empty project, and another one which can be used as a sample if you want to create a package for Umbraco. To install our templates, you first need to have the .NET SDK, and you can simply get the latest version from this link. The next step is to run the command on the top right to install our template pack. A template pack is in the form of a NuGet package and can be installed into the .NET CLI using the umbraco.template identifier. Once you do that, you see that Umbraco was added to your list of available project types and you can reference any of the templates by using their short names. The command line is required to install any .NET new templates, but they can be used afterwards in both the CLI and in any modern ID like Visual Studio and Writer. Flags could also be used as part of the .NET new command to customize our templates. One example is the SQL CE one. You can use it if you are on Windows and use the SQL Compact Edition, otherwise it's not supported by default. Here is a quick overview of how you can get Umbraco up and running from the command line. The .NET build command will copy all the needed folders into the solution, and the .NET run will enable you to start doing your Umbraco work fast and easy. 
Lastly, let's talk about the new project structure. In general, the contents of the op app data folder are now relocated under a new folder with the name of Umbraco, while the things that you used to see in the old Umbraco folder, your static files, are stored in a different Umbraco directory under the web root folder. Talking about web root, now we have two root paths. The content root path is the absolute path to the directory that contains the content files of the application, while the web root path is pointing to the location of the browser-specific files, so remember this distinction. There is also the app settings JSON, which replaces the web config and the startup file where we configure everything including Umbraco, but we will have a deep dive into configuration later on. All right, that was one quick overview of the most important things you need to know about the new installation process. And that was also it for me. Now on to the next topic. Yep, the next topic will be ASP.NET Core. As we mentioned a couple of times, Umbraco 9 is built on this new uh, framework from Microsoft, which is the latest web framework. The first cool thing is it's not tightly bound to the .NET 5. So this means ASP.NET Core is basically just NuGet dependencies, and you are able to run ASP.NET Core 5 together with .NET 6, which is pretty cool. Also, it's not tightly coupled to the web server IIS anymore. Instead, ASP.NET Core has a built-in server named Kestrel. If you're hosting on Windows, it is still recommended to run or host it in IIS, but IIS supports in-process hosting of Kestrel. If you're hosting on other operating systems, it is recommended to use some of the well-known web servers like NGINX or Apache, and then do reverse proctoring into the Kestrel server. All requests in the new web framework are going through a series of middleware. This is known from the OWIN project. So basically, the, the request hits the first middleware, and you can execute some code. It will, it will then call the next middleware and so on until a terminating middleware is hit. That terminating could be a static file handler, where the, stati where the static file handler actually found a file. Then it will be returning and writing all the headers, and then you can execute code again in your middleware. Another thing is, back in ASP.NET days, the old web framework, we had two concepts, MVC, the model view controller, and the web API. This is not the case anymore. Now everything is unified. So we have a lot of duplicate code that is now elim eliminated. So we can use the same base controllers, the same attributes for both API and web uh, and MVC. And the thing I like the most is the dependency injection is possible everywhere. So the web framework has a built-in DI container and it supports dependency injection even into views and attributes, which was not possible in ASP.NET. We also have view components, reusable components in your views that can execute code. So this is basically a replacement of child actions. But yeah, it, they make sense everywhere where you will have a reusable thing in your view and you don't need to have a, a special URL then we have tag helpers. Tag helpers is basically a new alternative to methods on the HTML helper or IHTML helper. So here I show a short example of the form tag helper that is built in into ASP.NET Core. So I can specify the controller and the action into the HTML tag or form, and then it will process it on the server, and the output will be an action so the, the URL instead of the controller and the action, and it will have inserted the anti forgery token automatically. Finally, we also have pre-compiled views. So now we don't have to dare if our, if our builds or views or templates breaks on runtime. Now we can actually have the confidence that this works runtime. By default, Umbraco is actually disabling pre-compiled views because it don't really make sense in a CMS, but we still recommend using pre-compiled views in your production environment. Also, we, we're going to talk about packages. So we had to make some package, uh, changes to packages because Braco 9 only support packages in using NuGet. So in the package section, when you create packages, you can now create schemas instead. You don't need a lot of information anymore. You don't need the name on the author or anything because this information is part of the NuGet package. 
Now you just pick the Umbraco content, so it could be content, it could be media, and some of the new features is that if you choose media which has an underlying physical file, it's actually picked at the same time and you will get your schema into a zip file. Then we have introduced package migrations. So you can run a migration plan for each package. Here's a short example where I inherit from package migration plan. I specify my name of my package into the base, contro or base constructor, and then I define my plan. In this case, I just have a single migration called my custom migration. The custom migration or the migrations can inherit from a package migration base where you have some helper methods to pick up the schema, but it is basically just a regular migration base like all the migrations known from Umbrago 8. By default, oh, sorry, uh, <laughs> package migrations. We also have automatic package migrations. So if you just want to ship a package that just installs the schema and the content you chose, then you can inherit from the pack automatic package migration plan and just uh, embed the package or the schema file in the same namespace, then you're good to go. By default, all these package migrations are executed unattended during startup, but you can disable this in the configuration, and thereby you can go to the package section and you will have a button to run the package migration for each package individually. And then I will uh, present the next speaker. Thank you. Welcome, Nikolai. Thank you. The next Nikolai. It is. The next Nikolai. Yes. My name is also Nikolai. And uh, today I'll be talking a bit about the new notifications patterns that will replace the native C sharp events. So the first question is why have we even bothered making this change? And well, there's a lot of convincing arguments, but I think the best one is that the new notification pattern supports asynchronous not uh, notifications. It supports dependency injection, and it's completely decoupled from the specific implementation from where the notifications are published. What all of this sums up to is that your notification handles, handlers will be fully testable. But how do I receive these new fancy notifications? Well, a simple synchronous implementation of a notification handler will look something like this. The first you will have, thing you'll have to do is create a class and implement the iNotification handler interface. This interface interface accepts a generic type argument of the notification you uh, wish to receive. In this interface, there's a single method defined called handle, uh, which will return void and will accept your uh, desired notification. And this is where all your um, notification handling logic will, will live. Um, as you can also see from the example, um, you can inject uh, the services you might need to handle this notification. But I did say that the, these new notification also can be done asynchronously. So how does that look? Well, it's very, very similar to a normal notification handler. Um, the only difference is that you need to implement instead a, a, a different interface called iNotification async handler. Um, and the handle method looks a little bit different because you'll be returning a task. Um, and additionally, you'll get a cancellation token as a parameter. But now that you've created your notification handler, Umbraco actually needs to know about these before it can publish the notifications to you. Uh, the way you do this is by with two uh, extension method for, me methods for the uh, Umbraco builder uh, called add notification handler and add notification async handler. Both of these methods takes two generic type arguments, the notification you want to receive and the implementation of your notification handler. When talking about uh, dependency injection, it's worth noting that all notification handlers uh, will be registered as transient, which means every time a notification is published, a new handler will be uh, created. Um, but some notifications are more special than others, and these are the notifications that we publish from scopes. Now, we always publish these notifications in pairs, one present tense, or as I like to call it, an ing notification, and these are published immediately and can be canceled. So they are published before any database changes has been made. The way you cancel this notification is with the cancel operation method, which takes an event message where I can specify a reason for canceling it. Now, we have our past tense or add notifications. These are only published once the scope has been successfully completed and disposed, meaning that the operation has successfully completed. Um, as I mentioned, your notification handlers are transient, so every time a new one is created, 
So how do you share information between your uh, ad or ing and ad notification? And well, to, in order to facilitate that, we have a fancy dictionary which you can access through the state property. This is just an ordinary string object dictionary where I can save whatever you need. Um, yeah, and with that, that's it for me. Thank you for listening. And now it's time for a video from Sean, I think. Yep. Hi there, this is Shannon from Embraco HQ, and welcome to the Embraco V9 launch. I'm going to talk quickly about the third party dependencies that we've got in Embraco V9. Uh, as you can see, we've kept quite a few of the dependencies from V8. Uh, a few have been replaced, uh, a few are new. Uh, but I'm going to talk mostly about the top to Examine 2.0 and Smidge 4.0. So what is Smidge? It's a runtime bundler uh, made for ASP.NET Core, uh, started seven years ago, also built on DNX. Uh, it's come a long way since then, and version four, which is just released, is now supporting NetCore 3.1 and .NET 5. Uh, all information can be found on my GitHub, github slash shazwaza slash smidge. Um, Braco uses Smidge for all cache busting for its assets. Uh, it bundles, combines, and compresses uh, your app plugins. But a new feature in Embraco is that that's totally configurable uh, via your package manifest. Uh, other than that, used for JavaScript result minification in some controllers, and it bundles some back office assets. But that just combines. It doesn't minify because that's done with Gulp. Uh, you can also use it on your own front end, of course. Uh, so the Changes to the package manifest bundle options. Uh, this is optional, uh, but the default means that your uh, assets in your app plugins will be bundled uh, together with the other uh, app plugins. If you say none, it will just be uh, given to the browser as is. And independent means Smidge will make uh, an independent bundle for your app plugins. Uh, to use this on your front end, it's very simple. So you can say use Smidge, and you can create bundles in all sorts of ways. There's plenty of documentation on the Smidge uh, GitHub, uh, but check it out. And then to render is just a simple script tag, which uh, uses tag helpers behind the scenes. Examine 2.0 has just been released. Uh, it's a pretty huge version because it now uses Lucene.NET 4.8, uh, also supporting .NET Standard 2. Um, you can also find documentation on shazwaza slash examine. So the new changes are that all index creation and configuration is done up front at configuration time, and it just uses the I options pattern, so it's pretty simple. Uh, the good news as well is that we've updated all the docs, so there's V2 and V1 examples and documentation um, on the GitHub link there. And this is now cross-platform, so it now works with uh, Linux as well. Um, a few other small changes, uh, simpler APIs, better paging support, um, but nothing huge. Uh, the things that are similar, so the Fluent API syntax and the leasing syntax that you've all been using uh, pretty much stays the same. And of course, you can change the data types and uh, the same extensibilities there. Uh, if you want to use examine uh, two in your own projects, uh, you just add examine and then say add examine leasing index. Uh, for Embraco based indexes, uh, the syntax is very similar. Uh, you can find examples in the Embraco core. And I'd just like to say a big shout out to all those package maintainers out there. Thank you and high five, you rock. Let's talk about the new Microsoft abstractions in .NET Core and .NET 5. In Embraco 8, the CMS project provided abstractions around some of its dependencies to prevent tight coupling. It was possible to swap these out for your own preferences if you were willing to write your own adapters or make use of someone else's. Whilst Embraco is popular, it's unlikely these adapters would be provided by the upstream vendor. With .NET Core, Microsoft has provided their own abstractions for common use cases, and it makes a lot of sense for vendors to supply implementations that work with these abstractions. This is great news for us as we no longer have to provide these abstractions which can be tough to design with enough flexibility to meet all use cases. It's also great news for Embraco developers who will have access to a much wider set of tools without having to worry so much about the integration work required. So what's changed? For logging, Embraco no longer provides an iLogger interface. Instead, we make use of the interface of the same name found in the Microsoft Extensions logging package. By default, we still provide a Serilog logger under the hood but if you wanted to add additional providers, it's easier than ever before. 
Updating projects to make use of the new interface should be as simple as changing the namespace on a using directive and moving the type argument that identifies a logger from method calls to the interface declaration. How about configuration? In Embraco 8, we made use of an XML-based web config file, which would often reference additional files focused on config for a specific set of functionality. There were some pain points making configuration generic enough to work across multiple developers' environments without making use of transformation tooling. Additionally, transforming configuration for production environments could be a pain, as the out-of-the-box support focused only on the primary web config file. There were workarounds for MSBuild, for example, the excellent SlideCheater project, and CICD platforms often provided additional transformation capabilities and variable substitution. But with .NET Core, this has all become much simpler. Instead of having a single source for configuration, multiple configuration providers can be combined together to build the required config for an environment. We make use of the default setup, which will read application configuration from a variety of sources in order, with lots of providers possessing the ability to replace values set by previous providers. This makes it easy to have a default setting in a config file, which is overwritten by an environment-specific config file or an environment variable. Microsoft have introduced support for binding configuration sections to strongly typed classes to help developers avoid mistakes and refactor safely. Strongly typed configuration can be resolved in a way that changes are picked up on the fly at runtime without restarting the application. Check out the official documentation for details. You may have noticed that Embraco CMS has a lot of settings to tweak, so we've provided a JSON schema file to aid in discovery of all the available options. If your editor supports this, you will get code completion and hinting when editing config files. Finally, dependency injection. Embraco 8 introduced an inversion of control, or IOC container, for automatic dependency injection into the CMS out of the box, where previously this had been left for developers to decide whether to add themselves. As with logging, we provided abstractions, the iFactory and iRegister interfaces to avoid tight coupling to our chosen container, LightInject, but even then it wasn't trivial to replace the underlying container. With .NET Core, Microsoft have introduced their own container abstractions, which makes life much easier. We no longer provide the iRegister and iFactory interfaces, instead we depend on their Microsoft analogs, the iService collection and iService provider respectively. In Umbraco 9, by default, we depend on the reference container implementation found in Microsoft Extensions Dependency Injection, which acts as the lowest common denominator for IOC containers. If you need more advanced features such as decoration, interception, or assembly scanning for registration by convention, you may be happier with a different container such as Autofac, Lamar, and many others which implement the Microsoft abstractions. Alternatively, you could check out the Scruter project, which adds additional functionality to the MSDI container through extension methods. If you decide to make use of one of these projects, you should now be able to follow their official documentation without having to worry about any extra effort required to make it work with Embraco. Thanks to these changes in .NET Core, an Embraco application is now more like a traditional .NET web application than ever before. In Embraco 8, we had the concept of composition. It was recommended that Embraco developers would register their services and replace upstream functionality in implementations of the iUser Composer interface, which would be run after core composers that added service registrations for the CMS itself. The composition concept is still around as we need a way to provide access to the service registry for package developers that cater for low code builds, and you can still use composers to add service registrations to your sites. However, you can also register services in your startup class just like you would in a regular .NET Core web application. It's worth noting that the EI user composer interface has been marked as obsolete, as the CMS now treats them no differently to an implementation of iComposer. The iCore Composer interface has been completely removed as all Embraco services are now registered in the startup class via extension methods on the iService collection provided by ASP.NET. Composer implementations no longer receive a composition object as an argument, but instead an Embraco builder, which exposes much of the same functionality, and it shouldn't take much effort to bring your old code base up to date. That's all for this section. Thanks for listening, and I'll hand you over to our next speaker. Hi, I'm Emma Garland from Rock Solid Knowledge and I'm on the Unicore community team, and I've given you a quick overview today about how we've levelled up Embraco v9 to use ASP.NET identity for users and members. The history of identity in Embraco. 
The user and membership layers first interacted with custom ASP.NET membership providers. And Bracus 7.3 added ASP.NET identity for back office users. Several Umbraco identity packages were released. Roll on to 2021 and version 9 now uses ASP.NET Core identity for both members and users. So ASP.NET Core identity is Microsoft's user management library that allows you to configure the authentication in your application. Why roll your own when you have this library that can do everything for you? It manages lots of areas, including users, passwords, roles, and even password hashing. A visual summary. Your app interacts with the high level identity user and role managers. The managers talk to the user identity stores and role stores to perform operations like creating and editing users. In turn, these low level stores specify how to persist users and roles and are tightly coupled to the data access layer. Underlying everything is the actual data store, in Embraco's case, a SQL database. Our data access layer in Embraco world is the user and member service and repositories. The data source is the user and member SQL database tables. They haven't changed much other than what you'd normally change for a version X migration patch. So the actual users are created as an identity user entity that is usable across all the layers. We have the Embraco back office identity user and the front end member identity user. Those are used to represent the identity of the user or member. There is an Embraco identity role to represent the identity role. For back office users in V9, my colleague Scott Brady initially swapped out the existing ASP.NET identity work to use the updated ASP.NET Core identity framework. Members didn't already have this, so the next part was to go and reframe members into a structure to match up with ASP.NET Core identity. Shannon had done something similar in his Umbraco identity package, but that was for .NET Framework and we needed it for .NET Core. So in version 9, members and users now both use ASP.NET Core identity. There is no more concept of the membership and role provider that was managed by the web config. We have no more membership helper. If you want to interact with members or users, you'll usually use the injected member and user managers. What stays the same? Well, you can still drop in your front end member macros like log in and register. You can access the member services and friends if you need raw access to the database, such as getting and setting custom member property type values. In future, you'll be able to access custom member property values from the member identity user. Members look and feel in the back office is very similar. The only difference really is that with access, users can now directly update member passwords rather than having to reset and create new ones. And talking of passwords, old member and user passwords use old hashing algorithms. So whenever a member or user logs in, if needed, they will be rolled forwards to the latest and greatest configured hashing algorithm. A whirlwind tour of identity changes in Embraco version 9. Thanks very much. Hey friends, my name is Morten. I work on the Cloud Platform team and I'm excited to share that starting today, all new projects created on Embraco Cloud will be running Embraco 9 by default. Let's have a look. So in the interest of time, I've created this project. I'll just clone it down to my local machine. First off, you'll notice a fairly slim Git repository as not a lot of files are initially committed to the Git repository. We included a readme file which contains a lot of details around how to run the project locally, how to set up a solution file, and an overview of the project structure. But let's jump to the command line and try to run the project locally. From my terminal, I'll type in the net build to build the project that I cloned. So first off, it's gonna restore all of the NuGet packages, and then I can continue to run it also from the command line. So as the project starts up, and because I'm on Windows with SQL Server Express installed, it will by default use local DB and install the database schema into that. So now I can navigate to the local website from the URL here. 
And because this is a blank project, I don't have anything to restore, so I'll just skip that and uh, open Umbrago. I can sign in using Umbrago ID. And that's it. I'm now up and running with my local project clone from Umbrago Cloud. From the back office, I can now start creating my document types. Looking at the changes for my local Git repository, I can now see that I have uh, my template that's been created by Umbrago and metadata files created by Umbrago Deploy. Now I can commit these to the Git repository. As part of the push to cloud, a .NET build process is started and the output is published to the website. Now that the push is done, you can jump back to the terminal, stop the website. Now that we have a proper project as part of the Git repository, we can also create a solution file. So if you come back to the terminal, I can create a solution file for my project here. And I can add my existing project, the one that comes default with Git repository, add that to the solution file as well. And of course, because I'm going to also add a class library. So I'll do that as well and add that class library to the solution. And then finally, I want to reference this new code project from my existing Umbrago project. So I'll do that from the command line as well. And now if I jump back to the root of my Git repository, you can see I have my solution file here. In the source folder, I have my newly created class library. And if I open this up in Visual Studio, you'll see that I have the two projects So that's it. We are excited to see what you build and hopefully you will find this useful and uh, happy building. So a huge thanks to the core team and the Unicore teams who have both done amazing work. It is safe to say that without them, we would not have had such an amazing new version of Umbraco. So thank you for your hard work. Now, we're going, to take another, we're going to take a look at another really crucial part of our latest release, which is uh, the, sorry, of getting the latest release ready, <laughs> which is packages. The bunny really is quite naughty today, <laughs> distracting me just a touch. Um, so Andy and Ronald are going to be showing you everything that they've done to prepare the HQ packages, as, and also to look at the amazing work done by the community package, for the community package develops too. Take it away, peeps. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, yes, in this section, we're going to talk a little bit about packages and how they've changed for V9. Um, to start with, I'm going to look at um, the Umbraco commercial packages, which, in case you're not aware, there are two of these. Uh, one is Umbraco Forms, which is a form creator add-on, which allows CMS editors to create forms um, for visitors of the website to complete. And the other one is Umbraco Deploy, which is used for transfer of schema and content between Umbraco environments. And I'm pleased to say today, both of these are also ready for V9. Is there no more confetti? Or is there? No. Oh. <laughs> Talk a little bit about how we've gone through this process. Um, what we've been aiming to do over the last, I guess, four or five months is to migrate the package functionality from V8 to V9 so that we have functionally equivalent products for the two CMS versions. We've done this with a single source code repository using two separate branches. And what that's done is allowed us to periodically merge between the V8 branch and the V9 branch. So everything you can use today in the latest versions of V8 of these two products are also available for, thank you very much, <laughs> are also available in V9. Um, we've released several betas and an RC for both products. And I just want to call out and thank a few people um, who have taken the trouble to download these. We've seen there's been quite a few downloads of the betas and a few um, issues raised. And I'm pleased to say they've all been resolved for launch as well. 
And then moving forward, um, we're aware that V8 still needs work. I mean, there's still features we can build on that platform, and there's still um, some issues we can resolve. So we will still be um, making changes to V8 and merging those up to V9 as we move forward. Um, taking the two products, first one, as I said, is Umbraco Forms. Um, we've migrated all the functionality, as I say, from V8 to V9, and including all the latest releases, including the forms in folders, which you've seen in the most, late, most recent uh, release of the product. The only change we want to really want to call out as being slightly different is that we now um, store the form definitions only in the database. Um, if anyone's a user of this product, they may remember that during V8, uh, we introduced this previously um, form definitions being saved onto disk. That caused a few problems, particularly in load balanced environments. And so having consulted with the community, we've taken the decision to only support form definitions in the database moving forward. And one other minor thing is we've retired a, a SOAP web service data, data source, which I don't think is used too much. And unfortunately, the libraries required for that didn't carry over into .NET 5. With Umbraco Deploy, similarly, we've migrated all the functionality from the current version up to V9. And I think it's important to also say that Umbraco Deploy remains a very key component of Umbraco Cloud. Um, it's what's used in, the, in that environment for transfer between uh, the different installations. And so because of that, you can be assured that it's going to get the attention that it deserves um, both now and moving forward. So now I'm going to pass to my colleague, Ronald. He's going to talk about two things. Um, what changes for those people who are building Umbraco solutions and using packages? And then what about those people that are building packages too? Yes, thank you, Andy. So the first thing is uh, for the people using packages that most uh, of the features are, uh, that are available for Umbraco uh, are also supported for uh, V9. So that's property editors, dashboards, trees, and sections. Um, and packages can still include server-side DLLs, uh, client-side assets, and also Umbraco schema and content, as Bjarke mentioned earlier. And yeah, basically, the big change uh, in V9 is that the installation is now uh, using NuGet only, which I'll uh, explain a bit uh, in the next slides. So in Umbraco uh, 8, uh, you could install packages from the back office using uh, the zip package format, or uh, you get uh, install using Visual Studio, depending on what the package order provided. In V9, because it's NuGet only, you can you have a single format you can install using Visual Studio, command line, uh, or by editing the project file. So why do we only support NuGet installation? Well, the biggest reason was because the uh, back of office installation uh, had some technical difficulties and challenges uh, to get it working on the new uh, .NET framework, but also because uh, NuGet installation enforces better um, practices for both source control and deployment. Um, and packages can now uh, be installed the same way as the CMS, which aligns it even more. But if you want to read more about uh, the whys and, and uh, yeah, go in, uh, into the uh, additional details, there is a blog post on our website, which is also linked on this slide. So the package installation uh, that can be done using command line interfaces is basically one uh, slide. Uh, one command that's uh, on this slide, uh, .NET add package, and then the package name. Um, the other commands are uh, showing how you can install uh, .NET templates to create a new uh, Umbraco website using uh, the .NET new command, and then yeah, uh, entering the directory uh, of that project at the package, and then by doing a .NET run, you'll uh, build a project which will copy the uh, NuGet package into the solution uh, and then run the application. Uh, but as I said earlier, you can also edit uh, the project files itself using uh, any editor you want uh, by including the package reference uh, with the package name and a version. You're doing basically the same as the .NET uh, command line interface or using uh, uh, 
Visual Studio uh, with the user interface. So that's the part about using packages and what's new for creating packages for the package developers. Well, the same set of uh, Umbraco ext extensibility points and APIs are available. So uh, they have changed, but only in minimal ways, like namespaces or the dependencies used uh, in Umbraco. And the more significant changes have been driven by the requirements for uh, .NET 5. Uh, so that includes uh, yeah, aligning with Microsoft best practices uh, like logging, dependency injection, and configuration. So to support NuGet installation uh, of your package, uh, you can use the .NET pack command. And then uh, if you want to include Rocco Shima or content, you can uh, download, select the items, and download a, a XML or a zip file, uh, add that to the pro uh, package project, uh, set it as embedded uh, resource, and then uh, yeah, add a package migration. So, uh, the content and schema uh, will automatically uh, be imported either during the unattended uh, package migrations or from the back office package uh, section, as Bjark also uh, has shown in previous slides. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, the package can still contain all the uh, necessary uh, files for, yeah, uh, the content for. Yeah, uh, front end yeah. Uh, files and also the server side. Um, as shown here, uh, package migrations uh, are basically two files the XML or zip file that needs to be uh, set to an embedded resource, and the package migration, which can also be an automatic package migration that only has to include a package name uh, as part of the constructor. Um, to make it easy to get started uh, creating packages, uh, the D Umbraco templates also includes an Umbraco package uh, template uh, that allows you to uh, get uh, started uh, real, uh, real fast. It includes a package manifest, uh, some build targets uh, to copy client-side uh, files into the uh, project, and also uh, the CS project uh, file itself. That includes uh, yeah, all the references and um, tasks uh, to make sure that all happens. So I'll pass it on back to Andy. Thank you. OK, so yes, in this last section, I just want to talk a little bit about the community packages. Um, I think we're all aware how important community packages are. I mean, they're a vital part of the Embraco ecosystem. And the availability of those packages is essential for, for many, product, many projects that people want to build on Embraco. And as we've discussed, unfortunately, but unavoidably, V8 packages won't just work on V9. Um, there are some changes. For many packages, it won't be particularly significant. For some, it will be a bit more. But all will need to change in some way. Um, but one thing I really want to call out is that we have delighted we've been with the, well, with the community engagement with V9 in general, but in particular around packages. Um, we've seen many people um, migrating their packages from V8 to V9, going along from right back to the alpha releases through the betas and the RCs. And because of that, we expect many of the important packages that you're used to using on, in V8 um, to be ready for use either now or very soon after launch. If we go on to um, ourumbraco.com, you can already go and filter for V9 packages. This was taken a few days ago, so there may have been some changes since. But you can see already there's quite a number of the, the packages that you'll recognize from projects you've worked on before um, already available for V9. Um, so lastly, I'm going to pass over to um, our roving reporter, Paul Seal, who has been uh, digging into V9 packages. Hi, I'm Paul Seal from CodeShare.co.uk. I just wanted to say a quick word about how much I'm really enjoying working with Umbraco V9. I've been taking part in 100 Days of Code recently, and I've been doing my own spin on that with 100 Days of Umbraco. And part of doing that, I've been testing out some of the packages for Umbraco V9, just so I can see what's ready for V9, um, what's missing from the set that I would normally use uh, when working with Umbraco. And I'm really happy to say that all of the packages that I would want to use in an Umbraco site that I would normally use like in a V8 project when I'm starting a new project, 
all of the packages that I would use are actually available now in Umbraco V9, uh, ready for the release. So um, let's have a look and I'll just talk you through some of these packages that I'm excited about and just show you what they do. Um, just a quick overview if you've never heard of them and what your use cases could be for them. And let's just have a look. So um, with Umbraco 9, I'm using the command line interface and I'm just doing .NET run in my project. I'm using a Windows terminal here so I can click on this URL and that will take me to the uh, page loading. Um, what I've done recently is I've been able to create myself a starter kit for V9, which I'm really happy with how easy it was to do in terms of generating a site and pulling and processing the package files with all the content and media and everything so that when you actually add the package and it installs it with everything you need. So it's much easier to do before you used to have to go th jump through a lot of hoops to get that to work. So on V9, it's a much better experience for creating the package. So this is the starter kit that I created, just a simple one. But what I've added to this uh, site is some of the uh, popular packages for V9 that are, are out. So one of the must haves is Usync. So there's Usync and Usync Complete. If you want to know what packages are available for V9, you can go to Packages, and then you can go to View More, and then you can click on See More there, and then you can click on uh, Version 9. And it's great to see the packages that I want to use. So Usync, uh, this one won the award as the best overall package recently. Uh, so if you go into here, we've got Usync installed, and it's just you could do a, a full export like that. Yes, run a clean export and look at it. It just goes through, and it and everything you can think of that you'd need to. Uh, put into version control to export and import into another environment. It can do that. Contact media settings and everything. So let's let that run. Uh, let's have a look at what else there is. So um, the uh, next one that I have decided is a must have is Contentment, another package award winner. And Contentment, what that does, while this runs, I'm just going to see, hopefully I won't break anything, but I'm going to go off and just have a look at this. So if I go into data types and I go to one that I created. I didn't actually call it a name, but um, what I've got here is just a set of buttons. So if I call this um, traffic lights, the beauty of this um, is, so this is just one of the things that you can do with contentment, and that is you can use a data list. So um, you can define what the, let's have a look, you can define what the text is that you're going to display and what the value is that you want and you can also do it with an icon and even you can do it with a description underneath as well so what you could do here is um, or you can then choose a display so what I want to do is I want to actually do a large you can choose the different um, types of display and I'm sure there was one way you could actually show Underneath it, you can show the description with it as well. Uh, but have a play with that. It's one of my favorite packages. Um, then the dashboard, again, is a must have when you're installing a new package. You get the uh, dashboard welcome screen here. It just gives you some useful information. And um, instead of having the getting started where it's got what could possibly be distracting content here, it's just simple dashboard just with relevant things for you. So that's ready for V9 as well. Um, and then we've got editor notes. This is a good package. And what you can do on editor notes is you can create notes for the uh, editor, uh, as it says in the tin. Uh, but basically, you can put in some content about this next few properties that you're editing, just so they can read a bit more. Maybe you need to add a bit more of an explanation for it. So rather than just using a label, you can add color and styles and things like that to it. And you can make it collapsible or open out. So that's another great package. Um, then along here, I've not tested out these ones yet, but I have tested out Slack health check notifications. That works great on V9. Our Braco user to do's, I've uh, created this one. This was just me testing out the ability to, um, there's a new user dashboard. So this section here has been made available. So what we can do here is I'm just going to, do this, uh, do that, 
and then you can tick them off or not or delete them so it's just a simple uh, to-do list uh, but also if you wanted to you could paste in like a link and then you could have that in your um, you could have a link there that you can click on that you leave on there and it'll always stay there so maybe you have some frequent links that you want to visit you can paste in the html for the link and it will render there so you can click on that so that one it's not a must have it's just a new package that i created but what's really good about um v9 is it was really easy to create that package i learned from kevin jump and the community videos that they did about how to package it up with the content and mark goodson showed me how to not include a dll because that one's just an app data an app plugin only so have a look um, at the project for that and you'll see how you can just create a package which just got app plugins yet they can still be installed via uh, the dotnet app pack add package um, what else have we got um, yeah we've got the big menu open street map that comes with the default start kit that that looks really good so allowing you to do free um, maps on your site using the open street maps hot hot chili page not found manager this is a good package as well that's all, also ready and i think i'm going to use this on my projects going forward so i've this site doesn't really uh, work with content pages or anything yet it's just certain structure but what i've done is i've used one of these project pages as a page not found and then um, what we can do now is if i can just do slash blah 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 and then it's going to show that page not found and the way you do it is you just do uh, you can right click on the home node manage 404 page and you can choose the page that you want to render as your page not found really easy so that's a great package for you um yeah portfolio starter kit that's the starter kit that i'm displaying here but there's still also the default starter kit that you can add and installing packages is really easy as well you're just in the command line you can just paste that in .NET add package and then whatever the name of the package is at the moment we're in release candidate so we'll do dash dash release uh, pre-release and that installs it and then you do build and and uh, .NET run and you launch the site so yeah i'm really excited about umbraco 9 um i'm looking forward to starting my first client project in umbraco 9 when it comes out officially and um yeah i just can't wait really anyway um i hope you like the video and i hope you like umbraco v9 i'll see you later bye Thank you very much to Paul Seal for that whirlwind tour of uh, Umbraco 9 uh, packages. And, and of course, also thank you to Andy and uh, Ronald for, um, um, for their uh, look at the official uh, Umbraco packages as well. Now, I'm pretty sure, Emma, that people are starting to get excited about Umbraco 9. Oh, I'm, excited. Oh, um, I'm excited. Some might even want to learn a bit more about it. What they can we might. do about that? Well, I think some people have been playing with Umbraco 9 for a little while, Sounds perhaps cool. we could ask them wh where to get started. Let's switch over to our Swedish correspondent, Dennis Adolfi. Mm. Hi everyone, my name is Dennis Adolfi and I'm here to talk about a little side project that I created called the Mbraco 9 demo site, which aims to help uh, newcomers to Mbraco 9 to quickly get started. You can read the full background of this project on the umbraco.com blog and also find useful links and uh, tips and tricks on getting started. But in essence, this project is a full site built in Umbraco 9, inspired by the official Umbraco demo site that most of us already know so well. But this demo site puts, uh, in my personal opinion, more effort on best practice and long-term maintenance. And a few examples of that is uh, that every page is rendered through its own controller, also known as root hijacking. Uh, every block is rendered through view components, which is a new concept we in .NET Core. If you want to know more about view components, check out my script article from August 2021. These controllers and view components allow us to prepare our own view models and pre-bake the Umbraco data so that we can put as little logic as possible in our views, making our views smaller, cleaner, easier to maintain over time. Speaking of logic, all the logic in this demo site is placed in custom services that are registered in the IOC container for easy access whenever we need them using dependency injection. And best of all, all of these examples are unit tested, so you can check out the tests project to learn more about unit testing in Umbraco 9. But wait, there's more. 
Uh, besides all of these mentioned things, we also have forms submitted through surface controllers. We have search samples uh, using examine. Uh, we have uh, examples of how to handle site settings uh, sh uh, by abstracting the Umbraco helper into one shared object across the site. And also an example of how to integrate third-party data as part of your Umbraco site, uh, for instance, uh, products, uh, by uh, reading in products from an external API and render them with a content finder. Some honorable mentions. Andrei Karashendov uh, has gone on a great job with adding search functionality to this demo site and Dirk Seifeld uh, has put a lot of effort on best practice and clean code. Uh, this project is open for collaboration so feel free to add anything if you uh, feel that you can add some useful examples to others. And I have to end with a really nice quote we got from Callum uh, from at Umbra Coffee, uh, which basically states that this is the best project ever. <laughs> uh, go check out the projects on GitHub. Have a great time exploring the new Morocco 9 and take care. Hello, I'm Carol Logan. I'm a Morocco MVP and Principal Engineer at Equator. We're a Go partner based in Glasgow and in London, and we're really, really excited to be here as part of the Umbraco 9 launch. And I'm going to show you how we can get started as developers with Umbraco 9 really, really quickly. So if I get our command line here, with Umbraco 9 and with .NET 5, there are two ways we can set up our projects. We can set them up through the command line, or we can set them up in our IDE. And first, we'll have a look in the command line. And what's really great is we can get from zero to a project, an Umbraco project, and just three commands. So let's have a look at that. Okay. So we can use this .NET new command, and that creates a new project, and we can tell it to use the Umbraco template. And here I'm telling it to use SQL CE, but you can use SQL Server, and we're telling it that the name of the project should be Umbraco V9 launch. So if we go ahead and enter that, that creates our project. And we can now, and we can run .NET run. And what that does is that both builds and runs the solution. And when we say run, it actually sets it up running in a little server, and it means that we can access it from our browser. Great. So here it is. It's running on a port for us. So we can open in a browser. So if I drag that window up here, we can now see that that's running in the browser. And here's the Umbraco install screen that we'll be used to. If you've used version 7 and version 8, this won't look new to you. So we can go ahead and we can um, set up our user details for the admin user. And we can see a really secure password, of course, for this. Um, and go ahead and install. So what it's doing in the background here is it'll maybe take a minute or so, and this can set up our Umbraco project, it's setting up the database schema and everything that we need to get started with Umbraco, and then it will redirect to the Umbraco back office where we can get started. Great, so here it's, it's logged us into the back office, it's giving us a tour if we're a new user here, I can say no, no for now. And here you'll recognise if you've used Umbraco where we're at, we've got an empty Umbraco instance and we can go ahead, we can start adding media, we can create our doc types, we can add our users and members and so on. And yeah, that's us in just three commands, um, we've been able to get started with Umbraco. And one quick alternative way that I'd love to show you is how we can do the same thing, but in Visual Studio. So now within Visual Studio, when we do create new project, we have the option to use those Umbraco project templates that we used in the command line. So you can find that by filtering by project type, or we can also use the search bar here. And we can go ahead and tell it that we want to create an Umbraco project. And you can set the version, you can set that you want it to be SQL CE, and so on. And that will go ahead and that will create your solution in Visual Studio that you can then run and install Umbraco. So thank you so much for for listening to my demo and I really love to hear how you get on with 
on Rack Room 9, and we're really excited to see it launch. Thank you. Hello everyone out there in the Umbraco sphere. Rhiannon here to give you some updates from Umbraco HQ's training team in regards to updates we have for Umbraco version 9. When we're not conducting our live training courses, training team is hard at work preparing material for version 9. Some courses require more work than others, so this means those courses will have a bridging course. That way, if you've taken the training course in version 8, you can attend a bridging course which covers the changes to version 9 and be up to speed. We're currently planning bridging courses for the following. Bridging courses will be available on demand at the start of 2022, and all live courses from January 2022 will be in version 9. I'd also like to talk about changes in regards to certification structure. My awesome colleague Gabriel wrote up a blog post on the subject earlier this summer. I'll give you some of the highlights. Our current system is when you complete a training course, you're given an amount of points. This point system is honestly a bit confusing and unclear, so instead we're revamping the system. In order to be considered an Umbraco professional, you need to have taken Umbraco fundamentals. To be an expert, you need what we consider our four essential courses. And for the coveted title of Umbraco master, you need two skill courses. This system will be introduced along with the version 9 training courses in 2022. There's a lot more great information about certifications in the blog post, so if you want to learn more, please check out the future certifications in Umbraco blog post on umbraco.com. Thank you Umbraco Sphere for always being so excellent, and look forward to trying out version 9. Hello, my name is Jonathan, and I'm part of Umbraco documentation team here on Umbraco HQ. I'm here to talk to you about how we have worked with uh, updating our documentation for V9, and how far that we've come with updating it. So how have we worked with updating the documentation? First off, we have worked since uh, the first beta was released, which is around five months ago. It's been mainly us working on verifying and updating our articles in our documentation with the help from the Unicorn team and help from community members as well. So how much documentation do we have ready for today's launch? We have around 70% of the overall documentation updated for V9, around 75% of the documentation just for the CMS have been done. Documentation for deploy and forms, our commercial packages, is fully updated for V9. And this means that we have more than 160 pieces of documentation updated for V9 at launch. Where can you find the documentation for Umbraco 9? Well, you can find our documentation at our.umbraco.com slash documentation. You can also find a list of articles that have been updated for V9 at our.umbraco.com at, uh, our slash documentation slash Umbraco 9 articles as well. Great. Uh, thank you so much for uh, listening. And I hope that everyone has an awesome uh, launch of Umbraco 9. See you all out there and have a great day. Jonathan out. Hi, Umbraco family, it's me, Warren. Uh, but today is not Hack Make Do. Today is Umbraco 9 launch day. Finally, it's here. Hurrah, I hear you cry. Um, yeah. With that said and done, uh, but yeah, in this segment, I'm going to hear from some of our friends in the Embraco community and what they've been up to, uh, hacking, exploring, tinkering away with Embraco V9. So you'll get to hear from Carol and Dennis and a few other people. Um, but in case you've missed it, here's the top five things. What's new in V9? So first things first, uh, the super obvious one is the new framework. So ASP.NET 5 or DEP. .NET 5 or ASP.NET Core, as it's also known, um, is the new and shiny thing that we're all going to love. Um, we're going to get cross-platform. Hurrah! We can work on a Mac, if that's your thing. Uh, we get things like Razor Tag Helpers. Um, super useful uh, in terms of generating markup. Uh, take a look. Uh, we get dependency injection out of the box. No more magic having to set this up ourselves. It just comes out of the box for us. Uh, we get things like view components. Dennis has done a great article on this on Scrift, so go and take a look at that. Uh, then we get um, at number two, 
this sounds like a, a TV countdown, uh, my top five. Uh, number two, we get updated dependencies. So client dependency framework from Shannon has been updated to work with um, SP.NET or .NET Core or .NET 5. And it's now called a smidge. So it does practically the same thing as client dependency framework, um, but just works on uh, cross-platform for us. Super nice. Um, yeah, if you're curious, go and uh, check out Shannon's uh, GitHub project called Smidge. Uh, more documentation and details are there. Uh, obviously, you don't have to use Smidge in Embraco. You might want to use it on your normal projects. But we all know that you build Embraco projects 99% of the time. Anyway, next up, that other dependency is the image processor is now Image Sharp. Uh, thanks, uh, James South. Kudos, massive effort for having cross-platform uh, image processing uh, available for us. So big kudos. And then examine has been updated as well from Shannon. So uh, next up at number three is configuration has totally changed. No more web config. Uh, configuration can come from anywhere. App settings, environment variables, command line inputs, you name it, it can do it all. Um, so I highly recommend you go and take a look at the video I've done uh, earlier in the year about configuration. Um, any questions, ping me an answer. Uh, ping me an answer, ping me a question, I'll get it back to you. Uh, number four, uh, we're getting there, uh, is events. Events has changed. Um, they're now static events inspired by the mediator project um Bianca always tells me this i never remember the exact details but it, it's better it's better is, is what i've been told uh it's because it's cool because dependency injection and it's not tightly coupled to other implementations so i'm just reading my notes here um and at number five packages has changed um Packages is now uh, .NET NuGet packages, just because of how we've had to do things at a lower down level. Uh, but those are the main five things that I think have changed. Um, I'd love to hear what you think. Um, so let me know. Uh, so yeah, I forgot to press record. Crap. Anyway, super school and uh, cheers to V9. Yay, so a huge thank you to everybody who has shared their experience with us. Umbrac 09 experience, getting stuck in, playing, collaborating. It is wonderful to see. We hope to see so much more of that in the future too. Keep sharing your stuff. So we've come to the last part of our show which is the Q&A. So we're going to be joined by some people who I'll introduce in just a moment. We've also created a frequently asked questions section on the Umbraco 9 page of the umbraco.com blog. <laughs> we've tried to answer everything, but sometimes you just want those real life answers. So we've opened it up to you and you've sent us in some, well, lots of questions, lots yeah, of very good questions. Yeah. So myself, I'm going to be on the panel. Runa is going to be hosting. We're going to be joined by Philip, Bianca, and Andy, all of whom you've met earlier, and a special guest, Carol, Principal Engineer at Equator, excellent community member, and Umbraco MVP. And we're going to be answering the questions. Over Thanks to for Runa. joining, Carol. Thanks um, for having me. <laughs> yep, uh, we've got quite a few questions come in uh, already. Um, as uh, Emma mentioned, we've got an FAQ blog post out, uh, and uh, we've also added an FAQ, FAQ to the product page uh, on umbraco.com, where we try to an answer as many questions as possible. And we'll keep expanding that with the questions that have come in as well. Um, but let's just dive uh, straight into it. Um, the first question here is, will we be able to load balance the back office with uh, Umbraco 9? I can answer that. There's no changes uh, in this area, but it is definitely definitely one of the areas that we want to look into now because it's it's easier now, and we want to bring more cloud native stuff into Umbrago from now. Yeah, yeah. But, but do do you mean load balancing in general or back office load balancing specifically? So so back office can't still because we yeah. are we are basically doing yeah, um, some stuff on the file system file system that prevent it, but of course the website part can be. Yeah, done like Umbraco 8. And Umbraco 7, I guess, as well. Yeah. Cool. Um, then uh, I think the, the most popular question, both uh, in the <laughs> uh, submission form and also in the QA on Slack, is 
how do you migrate from Umbraco 8 to Umbraco 9? Is there documentation? How long will it take? Is it difficult? Like all of these things. Um, Emma? Yeah. You, you've messed around with the Umbraco I've 9 quite a lot. Messed around with 9. That's exactly what I've been doing. Um, so, of course, everybody's interested in looking at migrations. Um, and this is going to be a nice experience for those of us that are doing that. We've got, um, there's fewer changes between eight and nine. So, you know, you're pointing at the V9 database and it's all going to just go. There'll be some alterations you need to make, you know, take a backup of the database as you would with any migration. Um, but we're also like the, all of our content can just be used. So that's great. The only thing that people are going to have to do is look at uh, a bit, little bit of custom code will obviously need changing with the .NET 5. Yeah, um, yeah. But there's some changes to views. And exactly. Like that. But it should be a really nice experience to migrate from 8 to 9. Um, we, you can go from 7 to 9. Obviously, there'll be more work involved, but you don't need to go 7, 8, 9. That's not gonna, that, that probably wouldn't be the best course. Okay. And we will be looking at doing some events where we migrate together. So we spend Ooh, some time, nice. you know, doing it in the wild as we did with the learnathons. Yeah, um, yeah, they, they were re really popular. So uh, yeah. uh, that sounds like an excellent idea. Yeah, it should be good fun. I think Bjarke probably wants to add. Yeah, to uh, I would recommend from seven to eight, but without doing any changes to your, to your code, just doing, executing the migrations because eight have some packages that helps migrating. All right, so the database gets the yeah. record. Exactly, and, like and then you can migrate from that state before you touch any code yeah. to nine. Yeah. But no changes between seven exactly. and eight. Yeah. yeah, I think it's, I think the, for those of you who were there in the seven to eight upgrade, uh, you know that there was a lot of conceptual changes, uh, whereas most of your code would just run because it was the same technology. But here's the opposite way. So all the content just flows over uh, yeah. easily. It's just a simple migration like from, 8.15 to 8.16 or something like that. The content just flow works. And then, of course, your own code and, and packages. Uh, but as we've seen in the stream, like lots of packages are already there. And I know there is a lot of them, even more that are, are, are you know, right mm. almost there. Yeah. I think it's also worth adding that where there are these conceptual changes, they're usually where we've tried to align with what goes on in .NET 5 in general. So you saw Paul earlier talking about Microsoft dependency injection. Emma talking about ASP.NET identity. Mm. You know, all these things that will be familiar to people coming from .NET 5 into Umbraco. We're also an audience of people. We want to make, we want to make that onboarding experience as, as easy as possible, as well as people coming from Umbraco 7 and 8. Yeah. Mm. What about uh, you, Carol? Um, you're in, uh, you've got the agency perspective uh, on this. Have you tried upgrading? And, and what, what, what do you think the, the path looked like? I've tried on a, a really small project, so not like a full proper um, client project yet, but now that it's launched, I'm looking forward to, to trying it out and seeing how it goes. Very nice. Okay, um, we've got a question here that uh, says, will Blazor work, um, so Blazor front-end work for, um, uh, for an Umbraco 9 website? Um, and it also asks if, if there's a guide on how to get this to work. And I think, Carol, you've... Uh, <laughs> Uh, tried uh, tried this out, so we might have some input on this. Yeah, yeah. So there's there's the way that's always been available, which is kind of build your own APIs and integrate Blazor that way. Um, but that would be having like a separate Blazor site and your separate Umbraco site. But now that we're on .NET five, we can have Blazor and Umbraco running in the same app, which is really cool. Um, I think there's a, a script article on it um, that I think Leonard and Jerome wrote that. Um, and I think um, Corna as well, who's also written an article on getting um, laser server side running within Umbraco in nine. So it's really exciting. And I've done a little hacking around as well. I've not written it up yet, but I've got um, the WebAssembly version running in Umbraco nine. So it's really exciting. We can now use all these new um, new technologies and things that have come out in the .NET Core and .NET five and then on to six. Um, now that we're on .NET Core, we can we can utilize all these new things. It's very exciting, isn't it? Mm. Super. Um, we've also got someone asking, uh, how will Umbraco 9 be dealing with URL rewriting? I don't know, or Andy, or... Yeah, so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> the best way to do it is actually to do it in code now, because then it works no matter how you host. Mm -hmm. You can do it as middleware, you can 
download some Nougat packages. But you can still use IIS rewrite, re URL rewrite, whatever mm -hmm. the module is, co is called. It still works if you're hosting on Windows yeah. and IIS. And of course, we have the internal rewrite still. So if you're migrating from 8, all the internal rewrites will still be. Yeah, yeah. so if you copy or move stuff around yeah. and things that delete them. Yeah, yeah, cool. <laughs> Um, we've also got, I think this one might be for you, Philip. Um, uh, it's a quick yes or no. Uh, <laughs> does Umbraco 9 support Angular or is it still AngularJS? <laughs> <laughs> it is, uh, there's no changes to the back office. Uh, so the back office is still the same uh, AngularJS one, uh, and uh, there's a whole separate project for, for going somewhere else with that. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I could talk about that for an hour, but that's not. I said yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> you can also refer to one of the memes that have been posted on Twitter. That, that, that tells you everything you need to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very true. Spider-Man, yep. We will have um, very much about how a new um, back office front end will look in the future uh, very, very soon. So keep tuned for that. Um, then. We also have a question here that asks, uh, what are your thoughts on running Umbraco 9 in Kubernetes? And will we offer any official guidance on this? <laughs> 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 to be honest, I don't have the skills to answer that question. So no, we can't, we can't bring official guidance right now. This is a commu community effort. But of course, if you find any issues, we, are, we will do whatever it takes to, to fix these issues. Mm -hmm. But we don't have the... Uh, the skills currently to uh, to host in whatever platform is available now. Yeah. No. Yeah, so I think that's the that's the that's the support answer to to uh, to this question is, even though we Umbraco 9 works on Linux and Unix and Mac and all of that stuff, and we do run all of our tests against it, uh, it's not something that we officially support. Uh, mostly just due to the fact that we don't have too much experience on that uh, in HQ and uh, the, the SWAT team and uh, and stuff. It's not there yet. Mm. Uh, it's probably something we will, we will have at a later stage, but uh, not from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it requires a lot more uh, resources. Yeah. Uh, but I know that there is, you know, community efforts out there to do uh, Docker images and all of that stuff uh, straight out of the box. And absolutely, that's that's super great. And I'm so excited that that's that's happening. Yeah, this is where the community will just step in and yeah. pick things up and write about it, get it published, get it on your blogs. The more we can see it's documentation that lasts for everybody else to use. So yeah. go play. Definitely. Mm. Do, do that and report issues if you yeah. find And it. report yes. the issues, yeah. <laughs> That's super important. Yeah. Um, uh, I think this is another one uh, you can start off at least, Philip, uh, but of course any of you can pitch in. Um, I think it's a good question uh, that has been raised uh, um, also in, in, in the community, as, as I've heard uh, lately. Uh, are we moving, uh, Umbraco HQ uh, and the product, uh, are we kind of moving in a um, direction where we are targeting a more tech-focused uh, audience? I guess a, um, a more kind of... Uh, uh, yeah, a more, a more, more technical uh, developer focus uh, than, than the implementer focus that we've also had previously. Yeah, I think, I think it's a good, qu good question and a valid question, especially with some of the changes that we're seeing uh, that one might get that impression. And I, I just want to debunk that mm. and uh, say that Umbraco is still the friendly CMS and we want to be friendly to all out there. And I think we're actually just expanding who, 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 we will, who, we, who we're targeting. So mm -hmm. we'll... Some of the things that, that we're doing, we'll, we will continue to look into how can we make this even friendlier, how can we make mm. this even easier to get started. Uh, we've kept some of the concepts uh, from 8 uh, into 9, even when they didn't necessarily fit the .NET Core model to be friendly, and we'll continue to, to, to make sure that that, that happens. Mm. Yep. Um, we've got an anonymous attendee who asks, uh, can the rabbit have a bath, please? No, that's not the point <laughs> of the rabbit. The rabbit's disgusting. The must stay disgusting. <laughs> we wouldn't want a clean rabbit. We, we like the rabbit as the rabbit is. Oh, the yeah. rabbit is armed. I think, I, think, I, think, <laughs> I think it's turning into a hassle. <laughs> we've been standing very <laughs> close to the rabbit. We can <laughs> confirm that the rabbit does need a bath, but yeah. the rabbit will not get a bath until it learns to behave. <laughs> um, <laughs> We've got uh, Ravi asking, um, what is the uh, future for Umbraco Forms? Is there any new things to, um, uh, to look forward to with Umbraco 9 and Forms? Um, well, I mean, the, the point I was trying to make earlier on, actually, is that I wouldn't separate V9 of Forms and V8 of Forms, at least just yet. I mean, 
we could, for example, say kind of V8 is done and now we're on V9 and that's mm. where the, the new features should go. But we're, we're certainly not planning to do that, at least for the, the short, the, the medium term. <laughs> short to medium? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <Great> save. <laughs> yeah, because, because, because um, I mean, really, all the features we're looking at, th th there's none that really require these fundamental breaking changes that we would have to wait for 9 or now 10 to do. So there's no real reason why we couldn't do those in V8. And we're well aware there's many people using V8 and, and buying licenses for V8. So I think the change that will come in over the next few months is simply that we've been spending a lot of time and effort on this migration, which, as I said, is a functionality like for like migration it's not been introducing new things mm. so we'll have a lot more time for that and we do have a, a long backlog of things to look at i think sort of back office localization is one we want to look at um we're looking at permissions so making that a bit more sophisticated um yeah there's quite quite a number of things we've got we've got certainly got a long list to uh, to be working through and um yeah hopefully over the next few months you'll start to see that come out for v8 and v9 yeah and if you have <laughs> ideas you know post them uh, on the issue tracker, and uh, Andy will pick them up. <laughs> or shoot them down. <laughs> or shoot them down, yeah, yeah. <laughs> really happy. <laughs> okay, uh, fantastic. Um, we've got Maurice asking, will we still be able to run multiple websites in one instance uh, of Umbraco 9? Uh, Carol, do you want to pick that one up? Sure. So, like, kind of multi-site in the one, the one instance? Yeah, totally. I think uh, everything kind of that we know and that we know and love about Umbraco is the same, except the tech underneath is now more up to date. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that is important to underline again and again and again. We have done so a lot, but um, Umbraco is still Umbraco. It yeah. really, really is. There are some choices we've had to make because of uh, the framework shift. And uh, there are some things that have improved vastly because of that. Mm. And there's some things that might have gotten a little bit more tricky, especially if you're not used to doing it that way. But most, the vast part of the APIs, the service layer, definitely the back office, it's all the same. Yeah. Right? It's um, just better. What we saw in the videos too, the getting started videos, Carol and Dennis, you know, just cracking on. There's so few changes, like a few things have been moved but it's really, really user-friendly. If you're used to Umbraco 8, you're going to have fun with Umbraco 9. Yeah, so I think it's faster. Just the, the biggest change you notice immediately is just that like, the response time is faster. So when, fast. like, just clicking around in back office just feels better and feels more, and feels more natural. Like, it's, it's yeah. a really great experience just, just from that switch. When we did the Lanathons, one of the things that struck Carol and I was that there was, like, we didn't prep. We just, you know, went in front of a crowd and started working with Umbraco 9. So it really wasn't too difficult, was it? No, it's a, some, it's a little bit of how do I do this in 9? But I think those parts have been mostly documented now, so it's just a case of the concept of the same, but it's sometimes it's, what's, what was the expression, Emma? I'll get this wrong. Um, who moved my keys? Is that yeah, the one? Yeah, who moved the keys or something yeah. like that, yeah. <laughs> but it's it the same concepts and we know how it works. It's just it's just slightly different for .NET Core. And it mm -hmm. usually is because it's the way it's done in .NET Core rather than an Umbraco way, which I think mm. is really positive. I, I think a positive spin on that is who updated my cheese. Yeah. <laughs> I think the analogy that Carol was looking for was actually Laura's, which is when you're cooking in somebody else's kitchen, they've still got all the same tools, right. oh, yeah. but yeah, sometimes yeah. they're in different drawers. It took me a while to get there, but... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Where's the spatula is more <laughs> what we're looking for. Hmm. Cool. Well, uh, I think uh, that pretty much covers the, uh, the questions we've, uh, we've gotten so far. So thanks, everyone, for um, asking. Mm -hmm. um, shoot um, questions at us on Twitter or uh, the issue tracker if, it's, uh, if, if it fits there. Join the Discord server. It's very fun over there, especially right now. There's a ton of memes going on. Yep. Pretty amazing. Um, so we're happy to answer any questions uh, that pops up there. But um, I think that'll do it for the Q&A section. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, gentlemen. And thank you very much, Car uh, Carol, for joining us. Hey, Carol. Thanks, Carol. <coughs> right, so that brings us to the end of the Q&A, but certainly not the end of our celebration. Nope, not yet. No? Ideally, we'd like to say a huge thank you. I mean... I think that would be uh, suitable. Yeah. I've actually uh, put a little something here on the table. Oh, me too. Is there anyone we need to thank in particular that you uh, can think That's of? actually quite a lot. Quite a we few. To thank. So we've, uh, we've yeah. created scrolls of uh, 
contributions. There's just a few. There's just, just a, few. a few. Thank you, Bunny. So we wanted to end our stream with a really big thank you uh, to everyone who was involved. We've said it once. We will say it again. This is a huge effort from all avenues of the community, HQ. We really have built an um, um, a global Umbraco release. Um, so we think this is going to make it the most exciting release ever. And with that, we'd like to say a huge thank you to our Bjarka and his team, both the Unicore team and the core team, uh, for all of your work on those projects. Thank you, high five you rock, we couldn't do it without you. We'd also like to say a huge thanks to um, Morten and the cloud team for all their really, really hard work in getting uh, Umbraco Cloud ready to host Umbraco 9, uh, which in turn also meant that we had to make Umbraco 9 work for Umbraco Cloud. But nope. um, that was a nope. fun experience for everyone, uh, and it's there now, so go try it out. Yep. We want to thank Warren uh, for becoming the cloud team chaos monkey and all <laughs> of the hack hacking, making, and doing that he has done for us. We'd also like to give a huge thanks to our DevOps folk uh, who have ensured that all this uh, can actually work mm -hmm. while we also have lights in the building. Yep. Um, Carol for getting everyone learning to work with the alpha and the betas at the Learnathons. We'd like to thank uh, James Jackson South and the entire Image Sharp team for making it possible for us to continue to do really cool things with images in Umbraco 9. Uh, we would like to thank Sebastian, for all the firefighting, the issues, the PR work that have made this release as collaborative as it can be. We'd like to thank uh, Andy and Ronald for being a super productive team, working on forms and deploy and helping out with all the other packages. We love the package team and we want to say a thank you to them uh, for everything that they've done to ensure that package devs have a wonderful experience. We'd like to give a shout out to Jonathan uh, for overseeing the doc uh, effort together with the documentation curators. The training team for making sure there's a clear path to certification. SWAT for all the incredibly uh, hard work they've done in making sure that uh, they are ready for when you ask questions about Umbraco 9. <laughs> um, Coma for making sure that you know how and where to find us and what to do with Umbraco 9. And then we'd also like to thank uh, Kim, our CEO, uh, Philip, uh, our CMS program manager, and uh, Jacob, our CTO, for at least sometimes being the grown-ups. Sometimes being the grown-ups. We do need some people around here that are sometimes grown-ups. Um, we want to thank the suits and the fish tank, uh, not just because they make sure we get paid, but also <laughs> for making sure that we have money for all of these endeavors. And we'd love to thank uh, our PLC, uh, Mr. Christian, for keeping things uh, lovely around here. Trina, nothing happens without Trina. So a really, really big thank you for Trina, who brought us all here today and <laughs> made this happen and this happen. And I'm sure she's even responsible for you somehow. And then we have a lot of names. A lot uh, as of names. Well. We Do you know this might take a while, so perhaps people might want to come and help themselves to some cake while we yeah, yeah, while yeah. we do this part. Maybe get a glass of champagne. If you uh, want to all ready. come in and um, and come for through. anyone we are not going to mention now, we're sorry we missed you. Uh, we are eternally thankful for all your effort. Yeah, super um, grateful to yeah, you. Yeah, we really appreciate you. You're the best. You're the best of the people. So for all who contributed to the repositories, and that includes, shall we do one name each? Let's try. Right. Aaron Sadler. Adam Hearn. Gregory Vienne. Uh, Anthony Dang. Matt Wise. Jan Skogo. Arcadius Beale. Bjorn Norlin. C9M Bundy. That's a great name. Carl <laughs> uh, Saguna. Uh, Sitzdev. Comstyle. Craig. Carol Rennie Logan. Cyberdot. Daniel Toft. Dave Wusterberg. David Dimoel. Olly Philpott. Marcus Johansson. Dave Dimoel. Philip Cruz. I did that already, didn't I? Yeah, I think. Sorry, OK, twice for you. Uh, I think I'll, I'll just try with Philip Cruz Martinez. Go, go, Dev. Dirk Seyfeld. Inezzo. James Dartnell. Yannick Anker. Jevon Leopold. Jesper, Jesper Mantusman. <laughs> um, Johnny. Jonathan, E42. Ooh. Keith Wright. Ken Jakobsen. Holy <laughs> Lachanophobia. Lauren Nito. Uh, Lee Kelleher. Lucas Karuba. Mark Goodson. Masood. 
Matthew Wise. Sven Giesens. Mike Chambers. Marek Schimmel. <laughs> yes, indeed. Nathan Wolf. Kenny Nielsen. Chad. Just Chad. Just, Just Chad. Chad. Owen Jones. <laughs> uh, Blake. Fixion NL. Ravi Mota. RJ Smith too. Scott Brady. Andrew Shearer. Simon Chiaretta. Mario Lopez. Sophus Monk. Steve Temple. We've got whew, Vishnu Kum Code. Vojcek Macek. Tomas Telepko. Anders Vienna. Alan Draper. Anant Jaiswell. Ma Ma Michael Argentini. Gideon Back. Benjamin Kaleski. We should go as fast as we can now. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Bjorn Fusterborg. Bushra Segnil. Callum White. Steve Morgan. Evan Moore. Uh, Connie Hoskam. Crazy Moore. Crick. Dan Booth. <laughs> David Armitage. Dan Lee. Dean Lee. Uh, David Shields. Emma Garland. Eric Jan Westendorf. Franti Young. Gunnar Ma. Igor Sedum too. Jakob Orgo. Jan Borup. Jason Elkin. Jeffrey Showmaker. Jörg Seibert. Julian Kalka. John Sito. Jose Marcenaro. Kevin Jump. Julius Putner. Lars Erik Orbeck. Lee Howarth. Leonard Fuentin. Louis J.R. <laughs> Maltworth. Martin um, Sink. Uh, Matt Bradleford. Matt Morford. Uh, oh, sorry, I got lost. Uh, <laughs> Michael Lindemann. MJ Praxis. Mehmet Avci. Nikolai Brask Nielsen. Nick Remington. Oliver Bossa. Owen Wilson. Patrick Demouge. Rasmus Olofsson. Rowan Botima. Robert Foster. Shadin. Sigmundur Merkur. I'm glad I didn't get that one. Simon <laughs> Justison. Søren Kotal. Søren Gregerson. Tom Madden. Vleil Leog. Indeed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Vito Rodriguez. Lottie Pitcher. Richard Ockerby. David Brendel. Sophie Toft. Sophie Neal. And Damien Peters. Woo! Okay, so that just leaves us to say a massive goodbye, a big thank you. And are we ready, team? High five! Cheers, everyone! Cheers!